Hey, everybody, we're live today. And I know some of you have been waiting for this interview since the last little um, snippet we did last month. Um, I am so excited to be here again with my good friend, Bob Miller. Um, we always have so much fun diving into um, pathways and trying to figure things out. And this pathway in particular has a lot of personal relevance. As you can see from the title, <laughs> the Carnian reaction, we're going to talk all about how that's affected me personally and how I've had some really um, massive insights and breakthroughs by understanding this pathway in my own personal health and how Bob and I have worked together already probably on almost a half a dozen patients in conversing and finding this pathway is actually more common than we thought. Bob will dive in and tell you all the fun and fascinating information that he's been working on. Um, but before we do that, just a little background. You can find um, all of my blogs, literally 10 plus years of content at jillcarnahan.com, all free. So if you want to know more about mold or environmental toxicity or benzene or uh, any sort of topic, Lyme and co-infections, it's all there. Um, if you want any products, you can find those at drjillhealth.com. Uh, so if we ever mention any of those, um, you can find them there. Uh, and then of course, YouTube channel, Jill Carnahan MD, you can find all of these interviews if you have missed any of them live video. And Bob and I have a whole, it's, this is probably our um, half a dozen mark here. I think we're on number six. So there's lots of great content there. You can also find me anywhere you listen to podcasts. So YouTube or Stitcher, and you can listen there in your car, or if you're walking, if it's easier. So that's the background. I told Bob today, I want to get right in. I don't want to waste a lot of time. Um, if you want to listen to my other interviews with Bob, you can get a formal introduction. He's just a genius at putting together pathways. And he does a lot of work in our field with teaching practitioners. And we're going to talk about the certification course at the end that if you want to know more, you can join him. We'll give you links. We'll give you all that information. But without further ado, Bob, let's jump right into the Carnahan reaction. <laughs> Absolutely. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to have quite a few aha moments as we go through this uh, today. Me too. I'm going to do a screen share here. And I think we're seeing the scene, the screen, correct? Yeah, perfect. It looks great. Okay. And as the title says, the Carnahan reaction. And of course, this is uh, not giving medical advice. This is just educational and informational only. So we're going to be talking about nitric oxide, pH 4 superoxide, and then how that can get out of balance and caused by environmental and genetic factors that cause it to go wrong. Here's a real brief what we're going to look at, what ENOS is, INOS is, what could be potentially negative consequences of excess INOS, environmental stimulators, something called NOS uncoupling, why that's so dangerous. And we're going to have a little more emphasis today on BH4, tetrahydrobiroptin, the consequences of inadequate BH4. Uh, maybe we'll touch on high fructose corn syrup and aspartame. And then what we're talking about today, the Carnahan reaction. And at the very end, uh, we're going to tell you about how health professionals can take our certification course and we'll have a Dr. Jill coupon code that'll save you $100. So I want to thank a couple people, Matthew, Beth, Mariam, McKay, Rippey, folks who have contributed uh, to this work. These are folks that, uh, that help uh, with the research. Now, we're going to very quickly go through nitric oxide because we, in our other video we talked about this so we're going to burn through this pretty quickly it's a very simple molecule it's one atom of nitrogen one of oxygen but it's now regarded as one of the most significant molecules in the body absolutely crucial to your well-being here's what it does it acts as a vasodilator causing the blood vessels to expand stimulates the brain helps men with erectile function and impotence increases energy supports wound healing supports the immune system and it's a signaling molecule present in the cardiovascular and nervous system. So an incredibly important molecule. Uh, Nobel Prize, 1998, given to three gentlemen for their research as it relates to uh, cardiovascular health. And I'm not going to read this because there's, there's too many here and we're short on time. But what we might be able to do, Dr. Jill, is a PDF yeah. of these slides, link these. So for people who really want to look at these carefully, they, uh, they can. We can give you a link for that. I love that. So everyone stay tuned because wherever you're listening to this, I will be sure and include a special link where you can download the, these slides. Now let's look at how nitric oxide is made. So I'm going to slide over another little map here. 
And uh, don't panic. This isn't as bad as it looks. Okay. So there's a substance called BH4 that's right here in the middle that combines with oxygen, something called NADPH, an amino acid called arginine to make nitric oxide. It's all accomplished by the NOS3 enzyme or endothelial nitric oxide. Now, on the other hand, when we are faced with a pathogen, when we are faced with bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasite, INOS kicks in, says, oh, we got a problem here. Same procedure, but makes more of it to kill the pathogen. The problem arises when this gets carried away. Mm -hmm. You get tissue damage or organ dysfunction. And we're going to go through these, so I won't read these now, but over here, are the environmental factors and these last two internal factors that will stimulate. Uh, also of note, uh, you know, many people are dealing with uh, mold and we'll talk about your experience a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, Clostridium, mold, Bartonella, they're sources of lipopolysaccharides that stimulate NADPH oxidase, mast cells, histamine, and the INOS enzyme. So, I'm speculating, but I think the reason this mutation probably got popular is because there was probably somewhere in time that there might have been virus, fungus, and parasites, and this was actually helpful. Yeah. However, now what's happening to us is we have all these environmental factors stimulating it. Then something else comes along and it gets carried away. Now, if anybody saw our video before, we, we focused on the INOS upregulation. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research and everything we said is true but we're going to put a little more focus on bh4 depletion mm -hmm. because what happens is if we use up this bh4 we're running off of bh2 and if we're running off bh2 we make superoxide a nasty nasty free radical mm -hmm. and then that makes something called peroxynitride that may further inhibit the bh4 and we're on one little merry-go-round here. And then we also want to talk a little bit. This was new. We didn't have this last time. We've mapped out the whole pathway of how we make BH4, how it's dependent upon something called guanidine triphosphate from the Krebs cycle, and then how we need folate and genetic mutations here could impact it as well. So we'll get into that as we move along. But that's the big picture. Okay. So as we said, BH4, oxygen, arginine, heme, NADPH, and specifically for the nitric oxide that helps circulation, NOS3. Interestingly, there's one RS number. Here it is, 3918226. Wild means it's the one that's the most useful, mm -hmm. T meaning the risk that it's less useful, and mutations on the T, either heterozygous or homozygous, will cause less than optimal nitric oxide production. So if somebody has a 23andMe or they uh, they do you know the functional genomic, they can look at this and uh, if they have one or two Ts, they may have less nitric oxide production, the endothelial nitric oxide. Interesting. And Bob, just to clarify, you're going to go into this in detail, but most of the mutations that we're going to talk about actually increase production. Is this the unique one that actually decreases? Is that kind of why you're bringing it to the Attention. Well, yes, this is the one that's the NOS3 versus Got it. The NOS2. Got it. Okay. So NOS3 is the one that helps us have circulation. NOS2 is the one we're concerned about being upregulated. Okay. But, so again, just to clarify, just so because I think the listener will understand too. So the, on the circulatory uh, bit, this will lower nit nitric oxide, which could be a disadvantage because we need that vasodilation in the circulatory system. But the NOS2 a lot of the mutations are upregulated, which causes the reactive oxygen and all of those things that you just talked about. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm going to make this very short because there are people that are a lot more qualified to speak on this than I am. And perhaps that'd be a, an interesting guest for you sometime. But I just want to mention that, you know, this is the pathway we're talking about with nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. There's another one called the nitrate pathway. And the L-arginine pathway is pH dependent, oxygen dependent. This one isn't. Uh, interestingly, arugula is one of the highest sources of nitrates. Wow. And what happens is when we get nitrates, they'll turn into nitrites and nitric oxide. So there is a plan B here. Also spinach, celery, butter, lettuce, bok choy, beets, and kale. And what we have to have is bacteria on the tongue that provides the uh, nitrate reductases. 
That's why sometimes using mouthwashes and fluoride toothpaste whitening could degrade this and antibiotics and antifungals mm -hmm. could, uh, could also decrease it as well. So this is an additional pathway uh, that could bring nitric oxide in, uh, you know, the good nitric oxide. And what's interesting, uh, and I, mean, I just learned this from, uh, from Beth Shirley, nitrates and nitrates recouples the NOS. We'll talk about that later. It inhibits these enzymes. We don't have to read them. It gets complicated, but they're inflammatory. Supports antioxidants, SOD, catalase, CERT1, and this GTP, that is at the beginning mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the phase to make BH4 in an enzyme called uh, heme oxygenase that helps us uh, break down heme properly. So some food choices there could be a big part of it. Now, here's where we really want to get into today, the INOS. Remember I said INOS is what uh, comes to your rescue to kill pathogens. Yeah. And now, Bob, if I could really quick comment on the diet, because people practically speaking, this is one of the reasons why leafy greens are such a core part of a healthy diet, no matter what you're doing, paleo, keto, vegan, anywhere in between. I always say a plant-based diet is still the best, no matter who you are, what you're doing. And you can do that with keto. You can do that with, it just means that plants primarily are still such a powerful source of nutrition. And this is just one more reason why leafy greens in particular are powerhouses. And if you don't have leafy greens, as part of your diet, you're missing out. It's so crucial. I think if I had to pick one element of a healthy diet, of course, there's never one. Leafy greens are right up there at the top. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now let's get into INOS here. So as we said, INOS is crucial for our, our immune defense. So INOS generates a very high amount of nitric oxide to fight bacteria, virus, fungal. NOS3 is the one that makes little puffs of it to dilate your blood vessels. When we get total elimination of it, it increases susceptibility to various infections. On the other hand, excessive has been associated with many health concerns. You know, as you've said, Dr. Jill, we've, we've spoken many times and we keep coming back to, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears, yeah. not too much, not too little. And, and that balance, uh, not too little, not too much is so critical in almost no matter what we're talking about. So not enough INOS, we don't kill pathogens too much, we can cause damage. It is. And you and I have talked again, if you're listening out there, methylation has been a hot topic for several years now. And you and I, Bob, have talked all the time about how everybody is like, oh, methylation, let's do this, or NAD, let's do this. And so people go kind of crazy with NAD precursors or methylated folate or methylated B12. But if you are in a process and you're really toxic or your genetics are not ready for that load, a lot of times these things make people worse. And this is one of the reasons why it's that happy medium. Um, just really quick vignette, when I first uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer, after that was realizing I was deficient in methylated Bs, I went pretty crazy on getting methylated folate and methylated B12. I did horrendous because my body was not ready for that. So just, I love that. I wanted to reiterate to those of you who are listening, if you're getting excited about methylated Bs or you have MTHFR, you have a, a NAD pH deficiency and you're getting NAD, some of these things too much is not a good thing. Absolutely. One of my favorite sayings is when the house is burning down, you don't paint the walls and mow the lawn. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah, we, we have to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a peer, you know, as I said, this is mostly a literature review. I mean, people will notice we're just bringing up peer reviewed literature. This isn't just somebody's opinion. Uh, excess production of nitric oxide appears to be linked to tissue damage and organ dysfunction, mm -hmm. even when we get something like septic shock. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's another one as it relates to the autoimmune thyroid. The enhanced expression of INOS in autoimmune thyroiditis suggest that nitric oxide synthase plays an important role in the inflammatory phenomena observed in this disease. Uh, Alzheimer's, what a serious problem that's becoming to be. Yeah. Here's a peer reviewed study. INOS seems to be a major instigator of the beta amyloid deposition and disease progression. Mm -hmm. Their conclusion, inhibition of INOS may be a therapeutic option in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, clearly we have to do more research into this. Now, as we talked about, when you've got uh, too much superoxide that's made, it combines with nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite. We're going to talk about that a little bit because more research is now showing peroxynitrite may not be as bad as we thought, but you'll still see you know, differing opinions on this. Uh, but in this article, uh, cellular generation of peroxynitrite may contribute 
to the carcinogenesis and tumor progression by weakening key cellular defense enzymes such as uh, N-acetyl transferase 1. Mm. And Bob, I just want to comment because uh, 20 years ago, 25 years old, I had breast cancer. And part of my journey in helping patients has been, why did this happen at 25 to me? And I think of many, many, many things. One of them is poor detox glutathione transferases and the pesticide exposure as a farm girl being raised in that environment. This NOS, which we'll talk about, I've got some real specific deficiencies in the genetics there. And I think that was part of the factor, this reactive oxygen. And I've got a lot of issues with um, uh, absorption and and uh, methylation of B12. So all of these things together, and there's more, but those are just a few of the pearls with the genetics that now allows me to understand things like, why would someone like me who is living a healthy lifestyle get cancer at 25 years old? Mm, absolutely. Well, we have part of the answer in what we're yes. talking about. <laughs> Here's an article, Inhibiting INOS Improves Triple Negative Breast Cancer. Wow. A relationship uh, in gastric cancer, the expression mm -hmm. of INOS and VEGF are closely related to tumor angiogenesis and are involved in the advancement and the lymph node metastasis. Yeah. Um, here we're talking about colon cancer. INOS expression and tyrosine nitration may be an indicator of cancer development and progression in colitis and colon cancer. And of course, part of your story was uh, Crohn's disease, I believe, as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> yeah. High levels of INOS expression in ovarian tumors are associated with a greater risk of disease, relapse, and patient death. Real quick thought as you're going, I love these thoughts that just pop up. So you talked about LPS earlier. LPS is the codeine of bacteria and you correlated it with not only, we talk a lot about the gut microbiome and this leakage of the codeine of the bacteria into the immune system through a permeable gut. And it's a massive trigger for autoimmunity, for uh, obesity, heart disease, cancer, um, even mood disorders and sleep disorders. So back to my story, the chemotherapy caused massive permeability and LPS from the gut was one of those triggers that caused the Crohn's disease. So then we look back at this INOS and LPS being a trigger there again, in my personal story that LPS had a big role, I think. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, here is this, uh, information on INOS and osteoarthritis. Uh, people can look at the slides if they want to, uh, to read all the, for the mm -hmm. detail. If you're joining us late, we are going to put a link uh, to the slides so that you can, uh, get these as a PDF. Um, here is for the respiratory and vascular system. So what we're gonna be talking about here is, is COVID. Now, of course, we're not saying there's any cure that we're providing here or cure, but this is interesting that what they're saying here, and this is a peer reviewed study, showed up in PubMed, Medical Journal Nitric Oxide, implications of COVID on the ENOS and INOS activity, consequences for the respiratory and vascular system. Look at this slide. When COVID hits you hard and the antiviral effects come in, that can be a consequence of the severe lung inflammation mm -hmm. as it suppresses the ENOS, the blood clots. So again, we're not saying this is a, a cure or prevention, but may explain why some people are more impacted by COVID because the INOS is getting upregulated by the virus going too far, causing the blood clots. Now, interesting, we've been talking about all of this, and here's an article that says, data are accumulating on a protective effect of high output nitric oxide synthesis, and a protective stress response and simultaneously aids in down-regulating the pro-inflammatory response. So it's like, uh-oh, Bob, you just made an argument that, uh, that the INOS is the problem. Now you're saying that it may not be. And of course, this information came from uh, you know, some of the researchers who were talking to me and say, mm -hmm. you know, this is being reevaluated. So I'm not taking a position on it, but the question is, who is the real villain? Now, everything we've said so far is correct. The upregulation of INOS is a problem. So we're not saying it's not the problem. But here's the scientific debate. Is the inflammation from the nitric oxide or the superoxide created with the nitric oxide? Or we'll talk later about NOS uncoupling. So it, it almost just becomes a scientific argument, not as much something that yeah. we need to be concerned about. But all of this that we've talked about might be the superoxide rather than the nitric oxide. So this will probably be hotly debated for years. Uh, Beth Shirley gave me this, uh, this quote, when you see firemen of fire, 
are they the cause of the mm. fire? It's so, that association versus causation, Bob. We know this in research, right? I love that you're bringing this up because it's really, as you look at that list that you showed earlier, I'm sure we're going to dive into of causes. Usually someone like me or our patients, they have other reasons that are having massive inflammation. And this just actually is, it's actually our body's protective mechanism, but it goes too far. Absolutely. So you know, maybe someday this will be definitively, you know, in all the mm -hmm. conferences they're talking about, clearly the INOS is elevated. No one's debating that. The question is, is it the INOS making the superoxide or mm -hmm. the nitric oxide? Stay tuned. But again, from what we're talking about, it really doesn't much matter because it's causing damage. Yeah. So there's a saying that's been around for a long time. Uh, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Here's your free radical. So let's look at a couple of them. Aluminum, mercury, okay. uranium, plastics. Someday we may have to just do a subject just on plastics. I think we do. It's so, <laughs> you know, I do these test um, urinary analysis of metabolites from a couple of different labs and BPA. I would say almost always phthalates and BPA come up for most patients and even patients like myself who are, you know, using really clean beauty products, they are ubiquitous. It's really hard. And I always say, you know, those BPA free plastics, I don't think they're any better. You know, the new versions, I think plastic is plastic is plastic. Yes. Please avoid that. <laughs> and we're polluting the ocean, the waterways. Yes. That's it's, we're making a mess. Yeah. Ethanol, EMF. We'll talk more about that. We spoke about the lime mold, even fluoride just found that yeah. today. The clostridia, high fructose corn syrup. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Gluten, we have a couple slides on that. Glyphosate, and then homocysteine if it's high or iron too high. So let's get into them. Here's an, a slide on gluten. Increased INOS expression has been found in the small intestine of celiac disease patients during a small scale clinical analysis. Mm. So what they're saying here is the increased urinary nitric oxide products in children with celiac disease during at least three clinical analysis, and there was increased INOS expression was also reported in the small intestine. In those with celiac, a gluten-free diet was found to result in a rapid decrease in the plasma nitric oxide and in O products. Uh, now, if anyone's interested in, you know, do they have gluten sensitivity, there's an enzyme called KIAA1109. And uh, when there's one mutation, you're usually gluten sensitive, Two, that really jacks up the chance of, uh, of celiac, sure. not a diagnosis, but a, a potential. Yeah. And here we have listed the, uh, the RS numbers, which is the good one, which is uh, the risk. And you can see by this bar chart that the homozygous only occurs in 2.6 and 2.5% of the population, so not very common. But when someone has these, there's a very good chance of gluten is not their friend. Uh, now we're going to talk about microwave and EMF. And here we're talking about more nitric oxide or more INOS when exposed to uh, electromagnetic fields. Now, as you said, we, uh, oh, let me show you this first. These are some of the genes that are related to uh, the calcium voltage channels mm -hmm. that when mutated allow EMF to push calcium in more strongly and then again make superoxide. And again, we list the four here if anyone ever wants to, to look them up see which one is the wild means the good one, the risk is the mutation. Uh, but rather than go into it, uh, your uh, video number 54, we spoke about EMF. So uh, there they go. They can go back. It was one hour and 21 minutes. We spoke about EMF. So uh, we go into there with all the pathways so we don't have to repeat it here. So uh, find that video and go back and, uh, and listen to it. We had fun on that one too. We did. <laughs> Now, mercury alone induces NF-kappa-B activation. You know, I probably went through it very quickly, but NF-kappa-B, among other things, stimulates uh, the INOS enzyme. So we all know that uh, mercury is dangerous for us. Uh, we all know the glyphosate, more and more information is coming out. It promoted NF-kappa-B that stimulates INOS, also stimulates INOS, other inflammatory markers. And so can you imagine the poor person who has gluten sensitivity where there's glyphosate sprayed at the beginning and the ending of the crop? Uh, these people are in real trouble. Yeah. Now there's genetic polymorphisms that are determinants of pesticide toxicity. Uh, there's a couple of them listed here, but the one that's most common is called the PON1. Yeah. And that will help 
take out the uh, the pesticides. And you can see here that uh, for this one, that uh, only 1.3% of the population has a uh, heterozygous 0.1 homozygous. Yeah. So knowing your PON1 status helps you understand uh, how seriously we should take uh, pesticides. I mean, we all should. Yeah, but uh, this even makes you more. But those patients in particular are really watching, and organic diet is really there's no other way because you want to prevent it after you're exposed. It's much harder to detoxify. Absolutely. Uh, now you did a great show with uh, McKay Rippy, and he gets yeah. into the uh, to the BPA. Uh, it induces uh, the uh, uncoupling of the enos that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so it uh, uncouples uh, the nos three, which is the good one, and creates the uh, peroxynitrite. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not sure which number show that is, but they could easily find it on your YouTube or somewhere else. To listen to the one with the, you did with McKay Rippey, a great, uh, great video. Uh, ammonia increases the expression and activity of the L-arginine transporter. Mm -hmm. I found this absolutely wow. fascinating. Uh, and uh, I didn't put uh, slides up for the urea cycle, mm -hmm. uh, but there is a genetic pattern that can mean that something called the urea cycle doesn't clear ammonia quite as well. And uh, then that activates NF kappa B, which leads to increased nitric oxide synthesis and protein nitration. So it's really important to make sure that uh, that uh, um, the urea cycle and ammonia is cleared. Properly. And you know, um, Bob, I do have people who have the smell, um, they either smell ammonia or they have urinary, um, you know, that smell in the urine of ammonia. Uh, so I do find this not too uncommonly, you know, in patients. Absolutely, that old person smell. You know, so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Kitty litter Windex, in case anybody's wondering. What yes, yes. High fructose corn syrup. We're going to talk about this a little bit. This only came into being around the late 70s, early 80s. And we're going to look back someday and say oops to this. Right. Um, it increases the INOS enzyme. And it suppresses a very important enzyme called CERT1. Hopefully we'll have time to get to that. Uh, CERT1. Is a uh, it's a very important enzyme that's actually related to longevity. Mm. Uh, we talked about this. The lipopolysaccharides activates NF kappa B, and then that stimulates the INOS enzyme and other inflammatory cascades. Uh, ethanol is able to upregulate both COX two and INOS expression. Mm. All right, now let's look at some of the internal things that are pulling the trigger. Now, Bob, there's many other reasons, but I'm assuming that be, I don't tolerate alcohol well. And I just decided, you know, 15 years ago, I basically don't drink once in a while at a party. I'll have one sip of wine, which mm -hmm. is, you know, and I don't mind it. I don't miss it. But I'm assuming that probably some of the genetics that I have with the INOS and all this, in addition to other things, are one of the reasons why I just, would you say that's, um, are there any other things that you would think about genetically when someone doesn't tolerate alcohol? Is well, there a set of aldehyde genetics too? So that's part of it too, but I'm also thinking of, uh, you know, glutathione. Yes. Uh, if you don't take your oxidized glutathione back to the reduced, that's a, another factor. So okay, which is probably, me too. <laughs> yeah. Probably multiple factors. Yeah. All right, here we go. Hyperglycemia increases INOS uh, in levels inside the body. This is possibly why diabetes is another uh, you know, morbidity that makes uh, COVID outcome uh, mm -hmm. worse. Worse, yeah. Yeah. Um, Here's another one on the uh, the advanced glycation end products. They induce the uh, the INOS enzyme, and of course, you know when uh, when I was young, we used to call it adult onset diabetes. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're usually over forty and rather overweight. Now children are getting uh, diabetes. Yes. Um, and then obesity, and then again another comorbidity. Mm -hmm. Obesity causes INOS pathway upregulation. And of course, you know, we are getting fatter all the time. Yeah. Um, histamine stimulates INOS expression. So the more we create histamine, the more we're going to create uh, excess INOS activity. And so many of these are perfect storm, Bob, because like our mold exposure, which I deal with so many people with that, uh, is one of the number one things that triggers mast cells. Mast cells then throw out prostaglandins, histamines, et cetera. And those people who have trouble breaking down histamine, production of excess, there's a bunch of different genetic variants. This just adds to the toxic mix. Absolutely. So rather than get into histamine today, go back and listen to interview number 34, histamine. Uh, we had a great time going through yeah. all of the pathways. So 
We're just mentioning it today. And if you want to learn more, listen to this interview number 34. Uh, then estrogen upregulates inducible nitric oxide synthase and COX-2. Uh, and what are we doing? All the plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, estrogen. Yeah. So those are called estrogen disruptors. If you all haven't heard of them and pesticides, organophosphates, a lot of chemicals in our environment. And what's interesting, really quick, toxicology classically will show these levels of toxicology. Basically, here's a level that it causes a toxic effect. When we see these endocrine disruptors, they are like uh, sometimes tens and hundreds of times lower levels and they're synergistic with other chemicals. So extremely low levels that are not considered classically toxic, they exert a hormetic effect. That means a hormone-like effect on the body and can cause real damage at very low levels. So our classical toxicologists haven't been warning us about this, but we see this, you know, levels that are really low and the environment are still causing massive damage. Absolutely. We've uh, made a mess of things, haven't we? Yes, we have, exactly. <laughs> now, um, as you know, anybody who, who follows the, the things that I, that I teach for the, for the health professionals, I'm a big fan of NADPH oxidase. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is part of our protection. When we're faced with a pathogen of any kind, if we didn't have NADPH oxidase, we'd be in trouble. It stimulates the mast cells, the histamine, kills the pathogen. Mm -hmm. But again, environmental factors are upregulating it. So since blocking either NF-kappa B activation or NADPH oxidase is sufficient to present INOS expression, they are now separate targets for therapeutic inventions, interventions mm -hmm. aimed to modulate INOS expression in sepsis. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking about that a little bit, I think, when we talk mm -hmm. about uh, your experience with the mold. Uh, now, again, we could spend the next 20 minutes talking about uh, NADPH oxidase. Just go to number 26. And we really dig into environmental factors that are overstimulating the NADPH oxidase. You know, Dr. Jill, when we did all these videos, I had no clue that all of these dovetail together in a perfect pot. I know it's so amazing, Bob. That's the fun thing is as we just keep diving deeper, we, and for me, what's been so great is I have a lot of ahas about patients that, as you know, I see a lot of the most complex chronic. I love mysteries. I love detective work, but some of these patients have been ill and have tried everything. And it's not a matter of the standard protocol. There's no one size fits all. And these little pearls where you individualize the genetics mm -hmm. are always so powerful in kind of finding out what for you as an individual patient with unique genetics genetics is the thing that's going to be a game changer. Absolutely. We got to get away from the pill for the year. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. A protocol. <laughs> I'm not a protocol kind of doctor. I mean, yeah, we use protocols, but they're all individualized. Absolutely. They've, they've got mm -hmm. to be. Um, then the uh, NADPH oxidase stimulates interleukin-6. You know, and I believe that is still the most watched video on your YouTube channel. I think um, so too. You've been so <laughs> Yeah. When I, and I grabbed this some time ago, there was 2,500 people that just watched it on YouTube. Wow. Uh, that's what's thrilled are amazing. That's in addition to your Facebook and other places. Yeah, yeah, we have all kinds of. But uh, I would, and we went almost uh, two hours on that one. I know. So, and if you want to see how this all interreacts, uh, watch that interview on uh, on IL-6. We did a, a great job. That was that. a really good one. And that was so relevant because COVID and cytokines and all the stuff that we've seen. I always say the good one of the good things that happened with the pandemic is it allowed the average population to understand like cytokines, some of these words that you and I talk about and a lot of functional medicine thinks about, but the average person hadn't been exposed to. Well, now most people have heard the word cytokines and they understand at least the basics of what that is. Absolutely. So I believe IL-6 overexpression is a huge problem. Again, as we talked about in that mm -hmm. video, all the things that we're exposed to environmentally. Mm -hmm. uh, nitrates and nitric oxide actually downregulate that NOx enzyme. Mm -hmm. So back again to your, your diet, those dietary nitrates uh, yeah. they help calm that puppy down. Mm -hmm. Now, the L-arginine paradox. Okay. Uh, you know, if you, um, you know, look, look at some things on the internet and if you want to boost your... Uh, nitric oxide, you'll see boatloads of supplements that have L-arginine in them. Yeah. And, you know, the literature is very clear. L-arginine turns into nitric oxide. So we tend to think, well, the more L-arginine, the better. Mm -hmm. And again, this is still being researched. But again, I go back to there can be too little or too much. Yes. And I'm afraid sometimes we're pushing it a little too much. Again, peer-reviewed study. I want to just what I circled here. We demonstrated for the first time that increased concentrations of L-arginine further potentiate INOS-dependent superoxide formation. Mm -hmm. 
wow. Wow. Uh, we need to really emphasize this because superoxide is one nasty, nasty free radical. And which further takes us back to the argument, it may be the superoxide, maybe rather than the, the INOS, but either way, that extra nitric oxide combines uh, with superoxide, I'm sorry, it combines uh, to make the, uh, so the, the, combines with superoxide mm -hmm. and creates this inflammatory uh, process. So. We need to be thinking a little bit more about uh, superoxide. And I, you know, I've been teaching about superoxide for the last 20 years. And uh, but I believe in the last nine months to more, we need to look at superoxide even more strongly because I believe it's more of a problem than we ever anticipated. Made by the uh, by this process right here that we're looking at, made by the uh, by the EMF. Uh, made by the Fenton reaction. Yeah. Many ways now that we're making more superoxide than we ever did before. Now, question, Bob, is this one of those things where you and I both love our hydrogen breathing machines? And that's to me, this kind of universal thing that neutralizes reactive oxygen. Is this one of the areas where that would be helpful, either the tabs or the breathing hydrogen? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was hoping to do it today, but I didn't, I was working on slides, but <laughs> I try to do it every morning and some days I'm like, oh, I really miss that. It's amazing. And yeah, if you want to know more, um, you can get hydrogen tabs on drjillhealth.com. There's a couple brands, just look up H2 tabs. Those are the cheap, easy version. The machines that Bob and I have, uh, unfortunately, they're about $5,000. Yeah. Um, so you may not want to invest in that, but we, it, I love it. I, I use it almost every day. Absolutely. Now look at this slide. While arginine is a cofactor for nitric oxide synthase, it has a specific role in regulating that INOS transcription and expression. In other words, too much of a good thing. Yeah. Now this study really blew me away. Depleting arginine decreases mm -hmm. INOS even under conditions that would upregulate INOS expression. Wow. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. Now, mm -hmm. this is fascinating and that's why uh, we, uh, Perhaps we should do a, a future show just on arginine. And uh, because we're gonna show you some really cool stuff here. Arginine does a lot of things, mm -hmm. but it will also turn into glutamate, which is excitatory, mm -hmm. which will stimulate interleukin-6, which mm -hmm. will stimulate mm -hmm. um, mast cells and histamine. Also part of the, uh, you know, the neuro, it's a neurotransmitter and can make us anxious. So excess glutamate can be a real problem. So let's talk really quickly about that because a lot of patients have this question. So glutamine is a precursor to glutamate and GABA and some people can go down that pathway too. There's been a lot of controversy when I teach there's some of the docs that are like, oh, glutamine powder, powder is harmless. Everybody can take it, no problem. In my clinical experience, which is not a randomized controlled trial, there are definitely subpopulations that do not do well on glutamine and glycine as well because these pathways can go down the wrong and cause excitatory um, issues with um, the brain and nervous system. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think uh, some functional doctors have just gotten a little carried away. Oh, you have a leaky gut. Yep. Let me give right. you this glutamine, this glutamine powder. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it actually drives mTOR as well, yes. which is the growth of new cells. Mm -hmm. This is something new that was just introduced to me, ADMA. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have not uh, about heard of this. And I was rather intrigued. And that's why I think we need to do a a webinar just on this ADMA and what it can, can do to us. Fascinating. Here's a quick preview. Um, proteins get arginine put in them. Then through methylation, we make this ADMA. Mm -hmm. ADMA will inhibit the NOS enzyme to make nitric oxide. This gets cleared by something called DDH, DDAH enzyme, mm -hmm. where um, we're working on making a new chip for our genetic testing. Mm. If at all possible, I want to make sure we got these guys because we've got to start looking at these. Yeah. But look what happens. High cholesterol, high blood sugar, high homocysteine or smoking inhibits mm. this enzyme. Wow. More inhibition mm -hmm. of nitric oxide. This is the good nitric oxide, the ENOS. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to learn here. I don't claim to be an expert on this, but here you can see your, you know, your SAM, which is comes from methylation, mm -hmm. that arginine protein. We really need to dig into this deeply. Yeah. 
because what this ADMA does, okay, increased risk of arteriosclerosis, such as increasing age and then hyper high cholesterol, hypertension, high triglycerides, diabetes, insulin sensitivity, high homocysteine and renal failure. And here's what really caught my attention. Mm -hmm. Independent risk factor for arteriosclerosis, cardiovascular death, and all cause mortality. Very wow. Ouch. Yeah, that always catches attention when you say all cause mortality, right? I always talk about <laughs> gluten and people who have the celiac genetics, when they decrease, when they completely eliminate gluten, their all cause mortality goes down by 70%. That's dramatic. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's a big deal because these underlying inflammatory processes will lead to many, many different mortality types of issues. Absolutely. So stay tuned. I, I think we need to dig a little deeper uh, into this uh, concept to this. So here's the reaction between nitric oxide, ADMA and homocysteine. Uh, and they're suggesting that they have a role in preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating. Wow. Uh, it's naturally produced in the body from arginine found in proteins and completely inhibits arginine utilization by NOS. It's been uh, repeatedly associated with a variety of health conditions such as endothelial mm -hmm. function and cardiovascular health. And then, as we said, the homocysteine uh, slows down that DDH enzyme and further increases those levels, which could have a big part of why uh, elevated homocysteine is such a, a significant factor yeah. in our cardiovascular health. Interestingly, though, we need homocysteine to make the cysteine that makes glutathione. So here we go again. If we didn't have homocysteine, we wouldn't have glutathione but it yeah, goes yeah. too high and we have a problem. Any thoughts, you may not have a lot to say here, but just curious if you do on the really low homocysteine, like say four or five, are those hypermethylators? Is there any thoughts around that, Bob? Yeah, they may be hypermethylating that, you know, through either the middle pathway mm -hmm. or, you know, through methylfolated methyl B12, they're, they're over converting. Mm -hmm. Might be other reasons as, uh, as well. You know, there's a sam saw ratio as well where, yeah. No, that comes down through so that could be disrupted so uh again i think a 3d chess game yes <laughs> totally agree <laughs> um so here's some of the interactions it induced nitric oxide production again nf kappa b and mm -hmm. for those who don't know it this is a very strong inflammatory uh component yeah. the nf kappa b um in mice it increased the ionos expression three fold wow uh, it was also found to induce NOS uncoupling, uh -huh. increasing the reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. And this blew me away. Deplete, depleted intracellular levels of your tetrahydroboropthin, that's the BH4, mm -hmm. 80%. Mm -hmm. That's a big That's, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's a big Dude. deal. Yeah. So, you know, and what's interesting, in our health coaching, sometimes uh, I'll say to people, is your doctor ever measure your homocysteine? It's like, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's ignored. And I, and I believe that uh, we really need to be paying attention to this. So, you know, one takeaway is uh, I think everyone should be aware of where their homocysteine is because it's a really important. Bob, I could not agree more. And I'll just say, if you're listening here, there's a few things you want to ask your doc if you haven't had checked. A1C, average blood sugar, you should be checking that every year. Homocysteine, for the reasons we just talked about, HSCRP, nonspecific inflammatory marker, um, and other things like um, immunoglobulin G and really all the immunoglobulins, very do few doctors are checking those. And I can't tell you the number of patients I've diagnosed with immunodeficiencies. And it's a very simple, these are pretty simple tests to get absolutely so i mean but this number right here i mean i was like you've got mm -hmm. 80 percent reduction in your tetrahydroboroptin that's the bh4 we talked about earlier in case mm -hmm. people are confused that's what helps you make nitric oxide rather than superoxide yeah. wow amazing mm -hmm. how do we calm this puppy down okay uh, vitamin d vitamin d has the potential to prevent oxidative damage by mm -hmm. suppressing the inos enzyme mm -hmm. yeah Zinc. Also, uh, that zinc limits INOS derived high output NO production in any ethelial cells by inhibiting NF kappa B dependent INOS expression. Then lysine may reduce the arginine absorption. Now they're both absorbed through the same transporters, 
And when we take the lysine, the arginine may not be absorbed as much. Mm -hmm. And just about everybody knows about, uh, you know, how you can use lysine for uh, for cold sores. Viruses, yeah. Yeah, so let me just comment clinically. So anyone who has frequent cold sores or genital herpes, either one is HSV virus, um, taking a decent dose of lysine, usually I have patients a minimum of 1,000 a day, sometimes up to 2,000, uh, will really inhibit that virus and often prevent you from having breakouts. This is a great pearl. It's an easy and cheap supplement. And as we're going to talk about with Bob, this has another effect on INOS. It's funny, Bob, uh, personally, I did have cold sores after my cancer. And so I've always been a lysine for the past 20 years. And I know I do really well in it, but I didn't know the secret of how lysine um, is also helpful at preventing that upregulation of INOS. And so mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me, I was doing it for one reason and I was getting benefit from another. And after we talked about this, I upped my dose and it was pretty powerful. Yes. I'm anxious to hear about that. I'm anxious for the update. And here we are in endotoxic shock. Here's the last, you know, bottom line. Mm -hmm. L-lysine has no effect in the absence of the endotoxin and thus appears to act as a selective modulator of INOS activity. Mm. Curcumin has been shown to promote the degradation of INOS. Wow. So of course, we all uh, know about that, yes. you know, quite, quite popular. Boswellia, that is okay. uh, frankincense, yes. um, showed a significant increase in a colitis group. Both pretreatment and treatment with uh, Boswellia exhibited significantly reduced lipid peroxidation, nitric oxide, and INOS, and showed improvements in the tissue in, uh, injury with mm -hmm. the ulcerative colitis. Um, there's something called uh, paractin. It's something that's uh, it's manufactured, but it comes from uh, andrographis, mm. uh, and it was uh, found to reduce pain in mild to moderate uh, osteoarthritis. But it also uh, decreases uh, INOS. Andrographide has been shown to inhibit INOS expression, uh, and it also inhibited uh, NOx2. That's one of your NADPH mm -hmm. oxidases that we spoke about. Uh, earlier. Uh, green tea and black tea uh, are helpful. Uh, and EGCG was the most active inhibitor of the uh, of the INOS enzyme. Now we're going to talk about NOS uncoupling, then we're going to get into the Carnahan reaction. So what happens here is BH4 is needed to take L-arginine, turn it into nitric oxide. That's what we showed earlier. When it turns into BH2, we make the superoxide, and we showed that uh, earlier. Now, but here we go. BH4 is the central character, and that's why I said I'm putting more emphasis on the BH4. So here is the pathway that uh, that we make BH4, the de novo pathway, and then there's also a, a, a salvage pathway where the BH4 turns into BH2, and then we bring it back to, uh, to BH4. So tetrahydroboroptin, we've talked about this, but here's more. Phenylalanine is an amino acid, needs to turn into tyrosine. Not good if that doesn't happen, BH4 dependent. Then we need the tyrosine to turn into L-DOPA. And many people say, is that the problem with Parkinson's? Um, and then we need tryptophan to go into serotonin. Without serotonin, we're depressed. And it just appears as though more and more people are getting depressed. Are you observing yeah. that as well, Dr. Dr. Absolutely. I think there was almost a 400% increase in prescriptions for SSRIs in the last year. Now, granted, we've had a pandemic, but I don't think that's the only thing. I think the toxic load and some of these things are really contributing. Absolutely. Look at this fascinating chart. Here's, here it is. Here's that GDP, uh, GDP cytochloride of hydroxase. That comes from the Krebs cycle. So if we have anything that's impacting Krebs cycle, we're not going to have mm -hmm. that GTP, guanidine triphosphate. That helps you make your BH4. The BH4 turns into BH2. Mm -hmm. We need to bring it back. We spoke about this at length, the endothelial nitric oxide. But here's the phenylalanine into tyrosine, the tyrosine into L-DOPA, the L-DOPA into dopamine. Look who's lurking, lurking over here reactive oxygen species. Uh -huh. so the more <laughs> inflammation, the less BH4. And another merry-go-round that we're on. Here's a, a little bit more specific how we make it. And uh, in the software, in our uh, functional genomic analysis software, we've just recently put in all the SNPs that are related to the production 
of uh, BH4. Still too early to tell, but we're finding that when people have trouble producing, uh, they have these strange inflammatory conditions they can't seem to resolve. I didn't list all of them, but here's one of them. And you can see even a heterozygous here, only in 1.6% of the people in our software. So these are evidence-based SNPs that will be related to the production of the, uh, the BH4. Uh, as we make a new chip in the future, we want to make sure we have all these evidence-based ones so we can see if someone's having some difficulty making a BH4. Yeah, I'm really thinking that uh, we need to be spending more time thinking about uh, BH4. So years ago, Amy Yasko has talked a lot about this. I don't have had her on the show, but you can find some information there too. And this has been a really big thing in the world of autism and the children that have been affected by that adults too. But um, this has been on the radar a while and we could just continue to learn more and more about biopterin and how important it is. Yeah, I didn't have time to find the slide, but I, I saw some things as I was looking that some autistic children, not all, but some are really helped considerably by boosting their BH4. I mean, clearly autism is very complex and I don't think there's one thing right. that's going to go. But in some instances, uh, that can be very helpful. And I will say I used to compound it and prescribe it. It's so much harder to get. I think a drug company got the rights to produce it. I don't know what's happening with that, but I used to be able to years ago actually prescribe it and it's much harder to get nowadays. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that if we see the pathway properly, mm -hmm. if we slow down the wasting of it, Mm -hmm. and support the production of it and support the recycling of it yeah uh, that may be sufficient in some cases right uh, now this is a fascinating quote here it's believed that the intracellular bh4 to bh2 ratio rather than the absolute concentrations of bh4 is the key determinant of mm -hmm. nos3 uncoupling wow. again that bh2 when combines with nos makes the superoxide which kind of goes to that argument that it may be the superoxide that's the real villain here. So stay tuned for that. Folic acid promotes the recycling of the BH2 to the BH4. And uh, it protects against hypoxia induced pulmonary hypertension by recoupling the uh, ENOS. So we're working at uh, some you know, nutritional formulas that may do this, but it's very complex. We wanna look at how do you support uh, mm -hmm. you know, the guanidine triphosphate? How do you support the recycling? Uh, just a lot to learn there. Now, NADPH is needed for BH4 production. Number 23, uh, if you want to know how to boost your nitric oxide or your NADPH, uh, listen to that pathway. And as you know, I'm a huge fan of NADPH, but mm -hmm. not just throwing a lot of it at, this, at one time. You have to make sure you do it judiciously when other things are calmed down. You do. And a real quick pearl on that, Bob, I learned last year, last December, I was speaking in Vegas. I had a big month and I was like, let me do some NAD. At that time I was doing subcutaneous injections. So almost daily. And as you know, it requires methyl donors to process. And I have issues with B12. I, I need a lot of B12. I require, I have all kinds of genetic polymorphisms around B12. So as you can imagine for two weeks, I felt amazing. I was on top of the world, great energy felt perfect. And then I crashed. And I started getting depressed, which is not like me at all, and really tired. And guess what? I completely depleted my methyl donors. So from now on, for me, this is an N of one. I always have to make sure I have methyl donors at good high doses with my NAD. Um, and I don't, I don't do well with too much. So some patients out there, you don't want to um, overdo this until you know your genetics. Absolutely. And then uh, might want to listen to number 16. I think that might be one of the first ones we did. Yes. Where we talked about uh, peroxynitrite. Now, what happens if we deplete that BH4? Okay, modulation of NOS2 activity by repletion of BH4 may be a safe and effective approach to reduce the frequency of atrial arrhythmias during heart failure. Here's another one, tetrahydrobroptin and cardiovascular disease. BH4 replacement may help treat hypertension, ischemia reperfusion industry, cardiac hypertrophy, chamber remodeling by restoring the NOS. It improves endothelial function by those who smoke, who are diabetic, hypertensive, those with cholesterol problems, coronary artery disease, and even with heart failure. All of that can be effect of supporting your BH4. But I'd go a step further and it's like, yes, supplementing that might be okay, but let's stop the wasting of it. Mm -hmm. Let's support the recycling of it. Let's support the making of it. And uh, one of my favorite sayings is I'd rather have you make it than take it. 
but uh, this is all we have to learn a lot on this. Love it. We need a Bobisms file. These are these are good <laughs> Bobisms. <laughs> all right, we showed this before. Other than here, you're seeing how folic acid or methyl folate and SAMI are part of that BH2 to BH4. Mm -hmm. Much more complex than this. This is a, a rather simple drawing. Now, as I said, this is needed for phenylalanine to tyrosine conversion. Here's a little chart. PAH takes phenylalanine, which is an amino acid, converts it to tyrosine. But look who's needed. Mm -hmm. BH4, NADPH. Mm -hmm. Efficiency here can cause a problem. Yeah. Um, now, both people know that when babies are born, they take a drop of blood and they look for a very serious illness that's genetic in nature, or they have to have very serious dietary restrictions. One of the things I'm hypothesizing, just that, is are we getting like little mini versions of that? Not severe, but mini versions because of our BH4 and NADPH depletion. Uh, just, you know, N of one talking to some folks. There's some individuals that have brain fog, insomnia, and they're seeing some improvement uh, as they stop things like uh, aspartame, which is pure phenylalanine. So we'll talk about that just briefly. Um, here is uh, foods that contain that phenylalanine. So if someone's having trouble with beef or lean chicken breast or anything on this list, you know, one of the things they may want to start considering is Am I having some difficulty turning the phenylalanine in there into the uh, into the tyrosine? And as we said, there's a serious issue called PKU yeah. uh, that is, you know, medically diagnosed. But interestingly, supplementation with BH4 can drive that activity in some individuals with certain mutations, lowering the plasma phenylalanine. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Bob, again, this is something sometimes you may, we may not have the answer to this, but I'm always thinking as we're talking, and we have a lot of patients who have excess dopamine because of gut dysbiosis and that upregulation of some of those pathways. Um, would SAMe or some of these things drive if they already have too much dopamine? Do you think you would need to be concerned about that? Does that make sense? Or It does, and I, and I can't say for sure, but I, sure. I think that's an abs absolutely true because I think we you know, need to be careful with SAMe. I mean, I've seen as yeah. many people have bad effects as, as good effects to it. I think, again, in the literature, you can almost induce a mania in someone who is very, very prone to high dopamine. So I agree. I always tell patients to watch. So if you're taking SAMe, it's a great thing for mood. There were studies against all the common SSRIs where 1200 milligrams a day actually outperformed most of the SSRIs. However, if you're prone to mania, insomnia, anxiety, be very cautious because this could stimulate a little too much. Absolutely. So I think most people know what this is. You know, it was first approved in 74, only started being used in the late 70s, or early 80s. And it's in so many products, we won't read them here, but uh, that's why I believe some people just can't handle those. Yeah. Um, it actually even can turn into formaldehyde. Um, and these are some of the conditions that are associated with too much aspartame, cancer, cardiovascular, graves, Alzheimer's, seizures, stroke, dementia. Uh, we're going to look back someday and say, what did we do? Right, right. What are we doing with these artificial sweeteners? <laughs> now, here we are. It's time to introduce the Carnahan reaction. So uh, we named this after Dr. Jill uh, because uh, of her health concerns. And uh, so why don't you, uh, you know, take a few moments and explain to us, uh, you know, perhaps what happened with your mold exposure or however this ties into um, to everything that happened to you. And then we'll explain what the Carnahan reaction is. Sure. So I had a mystery and Bob helped me solve it. And so, and it's, he's so cool to name it after me, but um, what happened was just a few months ago, I had some significant mold exposures with ketomium. And what was happening was I was having, I've always known ketomium for me is I call it the narcoleptic mold and mold to me has personalities because aspergillus penicillin cause more allergic redness, a lot of histamine reactions, but ketomium and stachy batteries, some of the really toxic black molds for me personally, they cause me to be just out like a light. Like literally when I get exposure, I've got to lay down now. I can't even stand up. And what happened with these recent significant exposures, I was getting these episodes where I'd almost like 
completely not black out. I'll tell you the symptoms in a moment, but almost like lose time. I equated it almost like if someone was like an alcoholic, which I don't drink alcohol and would lose time and space and have these episodes where they just couldn't function. So I was having these, um, maybe once a week for a few uh, times in August and September. And what would happen is my blood pressure would go down to about 80 over 50. And as you can imagine, that's not very compatible with standing up. And so I realized it was a drop in blood pressure that would cause me to literally have to lie down and sleep because I couldn't even stand and function. And of course, with that, I would have massive brain fog and exhaustion, and I just couldn't even function. So Bob and I, as we talked and realized that nitric oxide in my um, genetics was upregulated production and that we know mold would be a trigger, the likelihood of what was happening was that my, the mold was triggering the nitric oxide to be produced. That was a massive vasodilatory effect, almost like if I was septic and causing this uh, really low blood pressure and the symptoms that I was experiencing. Absolutely. And uh, that really took a toll on you. It did. <laughs> it was a rough month. <laughs> so here it is. Gain of function mutations in NOS2 enzymes. Um, and, and then other um, mutations, that's a spell, spelling error there, mutations in other enzymes that overstimulate INOS, along with environmental and internal stimulation of NOS2, creates mm -hmm. inflammation from excess nitric oxide or maybe superoxide. Mm -hmm. Excess superoxide through NOS uncoupling, depletion of BH4, creating more superoxide and potential disruption of the neurotransmitters. So that's what we're calling the Carnahan reaction. And I think 100 years from now, 200 years from now, people will still be studying the Carnahan reaction. So this is two of the IS numbers, RS numbers that we found in uh, the INOS based upon literature. And I suspect there's going to be more. It's 277-9249. Uh, the allele has been associated with, hold on to your hat, 4.73 times increased INOS expression. That's a lot. Mm. Um, and there was also increased plasma nitrate and nitrate levels. And uh, the heterozygous genotype was associated with increased levels of salivary nitrates and nitrites. Mm. Here it is, the, the wild or the one that's good is a C, the risk is an A. And you can see only 9.9% of the population in our software that analyzes. Keep in mind this software has people who are not well. So I would imagine among the yeah, general yeah. public, it's even less. Mm -hmm. Bob, I want to mention one more little thing that's related as patients listen to this. This isn't related to the INOS, but to me personally, years ago, I was really high cortisol. I've been high cortisol for most of my life. And in the last several years, after I've done a lot and, you know, I've depleted my adrenals a little bit so that I'm more on the uh, realm of normal or low cortisol. And I think that having that cortisol slightly deficient also contributed because cortisol will regulate your electrolytes and regulate your blood pressure as well. So to me, there was part of this perfect storm was clearly the INOS, but on top of that, why was this different from years ago? Well, now I have a little bit lower cortisol than I used to. And I think that on top of it and a whole nother thing, I won't go into this, but I was taking a medication that was lowering my cortisol even further. So I think that again, that contributed to the perfect storm of this being a, a massive drop in uh, causing hypotension. Sure. And keep in mind, the cortisol calms down the histamine. Yes. So if it wasn't doing that, that was further stimulating INOS, further stimulating interleukin yes. <laughs> more superoxide. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here is um, RS2297518. Again, the A allele, increased INOS activity, um, and uh, associated with onset of uh, early onset of Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and IBD. Uh, and there is a chart, you can see that this only occurs homozygous in 3.9% of the population. Uh, now, here's what happened to Dr. Jill. This is, you're very brave, by the way, of putting your, uh, your genetic information on, online here. There's a genetic mutation called HFEH63D, mm -hmm. and that may increase the absorption of iron. And you can see here, you've got one genetic mutation here, mm -hmm. and uh, that only occurs in 23.9% of the population homozygous only 2%. Now, if you remember when we looked earlier, excess iron stimulates yeah. INOS. Mutations in HMOX, they may impact the production of biliverdin that inhibits INOS mm -hmm. and some mutations here. But here we go. Those yeah. two that we pointed out, homozygous on both of them. Wow. So that just puts you in a position that your INOS 
enzyme is let's call it trigger happy perhaps that it, uh, that it just likes to uh, overreact over respond now bob on the good side of this i probably i've been super athletic and and good uh running ability good uh years ago i was a, you know did track and i did volleyball and did cheerleading and did all and again on the other side of this just like goldilocks i probably had some good ability for the uh, athletic kinds of performance things that need oxygen to tissues because patients use this it's just going to the extreme that it's mm -hmm. a problem absolutely as we spoke about in our first interview many people need to boost their nitric oxide mm -hmm. which they do uh, and uh, we're not saying that's a that's a bad thing. And when we first talked about it, we were trying to figure out is this gain of function or loss of function. I remember telling you, well, I don't do well with beets. I never take arginine. And as we went through it, we're like, I think this is a gain of function. And of course, you and your team have proven that to be the case. Absolutely. Now, as we talked about, DHFR is part of the way we get the uh, the folate there, and this is an evidence based SNP on DHFR. So part of making or recycling your BH two to BH4 could have been compromised. Yes. All right, we're gonna very quickly talk about CERT1 and then we managed to, uh, to get through the slides. So CERT1 is a very important enzyme. Uh, it supports endothelial nitric oxide. It supports superoxide dismutase. It inhibits NOx and NF-kappa B. And if you remember, I mean, we're throwing out a lot of terms, but these stimulate inflammation, but they also stimulate INOS. High fructose corn syrup weakens CERT1. However, resveratrol and nitrates support CERT1. CERT1 also inhibits mTOR, which can be inflammatory, which inhibits autophagy. And it also supports, we just found this recently, it also supports the MAOA enzyme, mm. which is one of the major ways to clear histamine, which, as we just said, stimulates INOS. Quick random question, Bob, the MAO uh, SNPs, are they mostly gain or loss of function or do they vary? Uh, we, from what we understand, they're, they're, they're loss of function. Okay. Yeah. Um, and here's some of the things that uh, the CERT1 is involved with. Um, it's involved with obesity associated metabolic diseases, cancer, adipose tissue, aging, cellular senescence, cardiac aging, uh, neurodegeneration, inflammatory signaling, uh, all of these things are related to uh, CERT1, and there is one of them that is related to, uh, you know, uh, pathogenic when it's mutated. I'm not going to read all this, we don't have time, but if someone looks at the slides, this is all the positive things that uh, that CERT1 does. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if you look at the, uh, the statistics here, homozygous is only 1.5% of the population. Mm -hmm. So, RS12778366 an evidence-based CERT1 mutation. Uh, T is the wild or the good one. Uh, C is the, uh, the risk. Um, so we'll go through this very quickly. High fructose corn syrup, I think most people know what that is. It's just been around since the late uh, 70s, early 80s. And which food products contain it? It's in everything mm -hmm. from soft drinks, canned foods, jellies and jams, processed snacks, fast food items. Yeah sauces and salad dressings. Uh, it is just everywhere and that will inhibit your CERT1. Mm. So I put these graphics together. Let's just say you have a typical breakfast of coffee and donuts. So if you have put some aspartame in there, that's going to increase the phenylalanine. Uh, that's going to create brain fog, low dopamine, agitation, insomnia. If your donut is made out of uh, gluten sprayed with glyphosate on it, that's going to stimulate the INOS. If you've got some filling in there or the icing that has high fructose corn syrup, CERT1 inhibition, decreased SOD and ENOS, increased NOx and NF-kappa B, NOS uncoupling, uh, decreased phenylalanine conversion, increases in superoxide, increases in, uh, in INOS. If someone would have mutations in INOS or SOD mutations, BH4 or BPAH mutations, these people are going to be on fire. Mm, yeah. So when you think about a perfect storm, you put some uh, artificial sweetener, glyphosate, wheat, high fructose corn syrup, uh, what a combination. 
And Bob, I just want to comment. People talk about Europe and the, a lot of times eating there, they're less toxic, less inflamed. One of the reasons, if you look at a label of a certain product in the US and then that equivalent, same brand, same manufacturer in the in Europe, they will not use corn syrup in Europe. They will throw it into the American made products. I've seen this over and over again. It's amazing because our regulations are not as stringent as Europe and some other countries as well. So sadly, you really have to become a label reader and just... I would just recommend you completely avoid processed foods because you're going to get this everywhere if you're eating Absolutely. processed food. Absolutely. And how many people have coffee and donuts? Uh, mm -hmm. for uh, I'm not going to read this. This is the uh, the whole list of uh, all the mutations that could be contributing factors to uh, upregulated uh, INOS. All right. As we said, uh, for if you are a health professional, mm -hmm. um, we have an opportunity for you to do some online education. I mean, People can take it as well, but there's no certification. I'm not going to read these, but these are the modules we have up now. Uh, overview, Fenton reaction, nitric oxide, glutamate, uh, gut histamine oxalates, heme and heme support, uh, mm -hmm. mast cells, NADPH steel, NADPH oxidase. And these are the videos that are listed here. Uh, Nerve 2 and KEEP 1, uh, more on NADPH, uh, glutathione, sod and catalase, wow. the search ones that we just talked about, phase three detox and autophagy. Um, we're probably about halfway through. We're making them as we go along. Uh, more modules are added uh, every one to three weeks. And all you have to do is go to functionalgenomicanalysis.com. Right here, click on the certification. You get the first seven modules for free. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we say to, to doctors, our health professionals, Try this out. See if this is for you, because yeah. it's not for everybody. This is not for the faint of heart. You have to want to dive deep, right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is an a, uh, yeah. not a genetic test, and uh -huh. it tells you what to do. Um, you do get to a point where you have to pay, and if you use the code Dr. Jill, you'll get $100 off. But you can try the first modules first before you even have to, uh, to do anything. And then uh, we do have the functional genomic analysis so software. We have a supplement line. There's the genetic test, and there's who does the uh, the research. So um, I know a lot of people who are not health professionals. If they, you know, want to talk to us about health coaching, here's our phone number: 717-733-2003, tolhealth.com. If you're a health professional only, uh, this is the software we use for the analysis. And Yvonne Lucchese is the executive director, and her phone is 717-466-5700. So uh, if someone wants to learn, um, you're there, and we're probably, hopefully in the spring or summer, uh, we may do a conference uh, on the Carnahan reaction, mm -hmm. where we will spend with doctors probably three days uh, talking about every aspect of this. I mean, we did a really quick review. We but did, we and Bob, you are amazing of the amount of data you just got through in like 75, absolutely amazing. I hope you all listening out there appreciate Bob Miller and what he's bringing um, I just have such great respect for you, Bob, and your tireless efforts. And what I love too, is you just, you're, you're genuinely doing out, out of the good for humanity and the good for the people. And uh, you continue to give, and you're so generous with your time with me and with everyone here. I mean, this is all free. This is your time and it's valuable. And I know how hard you work. There's sometimes at nine o'clock at night and you're just getting done with pa patients. And so so um, it is just, I, I want to publicly thank you for your efforts and myself and many, many other physicians are benefiting from your work and your team and all the research. And I am so supportive of your educational, your courses. Um, I completely endorse them and believe in the work that you're doing. So if you're a physician or a, a highly educated consumer who wants to learn more, um, you can uh, join that. You can get that link. And wherever you listen to this, we'll have those links posted with the code and everything. Um, I just can't thank you enough. I always enjoy our time. I always learn more. Absolutely. And a lot of fun. It's so fun. <laughs> and any, any update for you, how you're doing now after all that? You've oh, so much better. So much better. So I added lysine. I got rid of the excess and all the little pieces. I think we talked about in our little promo, but I was taking tons of glutathione, which was 
oxidizing. So I took back, got uh, rid of some of that. I was doing IVs weekly. I stopped that. So just let this be a lesson to you. This is my lifelong lesson. Less is more. And I, I'm like that kind of person who's like, oh, I want to fix this. I want to do this. And so often my downfall is just because I do too much. And so if you're listening and you're crashing and you have a ton of supplements, often with my patients, I'm like, what can we take out? Because sometimes it's too much. I added a lot more lysine. Of course, I've been avoiding mold. I'm doing so much better, Bob. And thank you for asking. Good. And our goal is in 2022, you just laugh and mold. Yes. Like, <laughs> oh, it's nothing. It's merely a flesh wound. <laughs> oh, well, thank always, you so much. Thank pleasure. you. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I um, uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Please leave comments, maybe future topics. I know Bob and I are always brewing about what to bring next, but um, as always, such a fun time. Thank you so much, Bob. My pleasure. Have a great rest of your day.